Hi everyone, welcome to uh, week three. Week three. Um, <laughs> well done to everyone who's turned up today on a public holiday and such a nice sunny public holiday to, to boot. Um, so I, I commiserate with you guys having to be in a windowless room listening to me talk about um, dimensional modelling. But dimensional modelling is a fairly important topic for, for data warehousing. Um, 
as I said a couple of weeks ago when we, we started the semester, um, we're going to teach you an alternative modelling technique to the entity relationship modelling, which um, all of you should be uh, very familiar with. Um, so when you've done database uh, units in the past, whether it's FIT 9003 with me or with, with other, um, other courses, um, I'm sure you've been taught to design your databases well, normalise to third normal form and all that kind of thing. Um, well, this week we're going to tell you to forget all of that and break all of those rules. Um, and I, I, we've hinted a little bit at, at why that's the case uh, back in week one. We talked a little bit about how uh, the design requirements for a data warehouse are fundamentally different to the design requirements for um, most other kinds of, of database, relational databases. Um, so this week we're going to actually pick up that, that, uh, that, that technique. Um, last week in the tutorials we, we played around with some SQL. Um, hopefully the lesson that you guys picked up from that uh, tutorial was that um, doing SQL or running SQL, the kinds of SQL that we uh, are typically running for uh, business intelligence systems and things like that, is a lot more complex when you target a normalised database versus a denormalised database structured according to what we call a, a star schema. So we're going to teach you this week how to design star schemas, and I'll teach you the difference between a, well, a couple of terminal, uh, pieces of terminology, uh, a dimensional model and a star schema, um, and what the difference is between the two. Um, a dimensional, let me go back a, a step, a star schema is a kind of dimensional model, um, but it's a, it's a kind of dimensional model that allows us to implement a dimensional structure in a relational database management system. Um, now you can get database management systems that natively support this multi-dimensional stuff that we're going to learn about, um, but by far and away the most common approach to implementing a data warehouse is through the use of a, uh, the kinds of database management systems that organisations already have, which is by far and away typically a relational database management system. So we'll talk about dimensional modelling and then we'll talk about how you implement those using relational databases in a, in a star schema type format. And that'll be the, the lecture. In the tutorial we'll um, do a bit of a practice exercise. So um, the reason why it's, it's important to learn this dimensional stuff and the reason why dimensional modelling came about in the first place was that um, or is that the, the, the data structure of a uh, data warehouse is much more exposed to the end users than you find for other kinds of, of database management systems or database uh, projects. Um, remember back in week one we talked a bit about how the uh, idea of providing decision support to end users um, results in evolutionary, um, almost exploratory process uh, where the users learn about the decision problem. So rather than setting up a, a predefined workflow that says uh, a user first does this step, then this step, then this step, with business intelligence tools, decision support systems and so on, the emphasis is on allowing the users to define their own path through the information structure because they don't know beforehand what information they're going to need and, and not necessarily what format they're going to need it in. So one of the design requirements for a data warehouse is to make the uh, allow the data structure in the data warehouse to come through in the user interface. It's much more exposed. Um, I've got a short video in a, in a bit um, that will show you a typical business intelligence system uh, kind of in use and you'll see the data structure literally on the screen um, as the users navigate uh, their way through it. For those of you who've done 9003 with me um, before, you'll have seen this video, so um, it's, it's kind of a refresher. In fact, we've, we've done this topic in 9003 as well. So. For those of you who've done 9003, it's a refresher uh, today um, with a bit of a chance to do some exercises. Um, and for those of you who haven't done 9003, hopefully this is, this is something new. So anyway, the, the idea of, of the data structure coming through in the user interface places um, a significant design constraint on the data modeler for a data warehouse. Um, because we're dealing with an exploratory, ambiguous, undefined usage pattern, uh, with a with business intelligence system, we, uh, we're trying to encourage exploration. Um, if we discourage exploration of that, that information structure, then we're diminishing the kind of decision or the level of support provided by the decision support tools, the, the business intelligence tools. So on the one hand, we've got this data structure emerging through the user interface. It, it almost becomes the user interface. And on the other hand, we want systems that are simple for often non-technical people uh, to be able to use. In other words, throwing an SQL tool, kind of like what you guys used in the uh, tutorial, um, at a, a, a managerial end users and, and considering that business intelligence or decision support is, is just not, not adequate. Um, so we need an easy to navigate, easy to understand data structure. 
It turns out that ER models, even though the, the graphical diagramming technique of, of ER modelling was initially intended to be a, a sort of user-friendly way of representing data structures, um, a, a tool that data modellers could use to communicate effectively with clients, non-technical business people, um, research shows that people don't understand ER models very well. In fact, even people who are expert data modellers don't other, understand other people's data models very well. Um, they are difficult to understand. They make sense to the individual data modeler as you're doing the data model, um, but when you're as a communication tool, ER diagrams are actually not very effective at, at what they're supposed to do. Even though we're all taught that this is this is uh, the whole point of an ER diagram is to communicate uh, design ideas. Um, so what we're faced with is uh, a deficiency with entity relationship diagramming approaches, particularly third normal form versions of those of those entity relationship structures that create non-user friendly data structures. So hence dimensional modeling came about as a as an answer, an antidote to that uh, to that problem, to come up with a user friendly, intuitive data structure that encourages the end users to explore the information space that's contained within the data warehouse. Uh, I'm using the term information space very specifically because what we're doing is with a dimensional model is defining the um, the ways in which users can move through the information in the data warehouse. It, it, the, the metaphor is um, a, a kind of geometric space, um, and, and hence the, the term dimensional modelling. Anyway, let's get into it. Let's, uh, let's sort of walk through the argument. So, dimensional modelling is, is one of the main design techniques used in data warehousing. However, that being said, there are a lot of data warehouse developers, a lot of data warehouse designers who still use third normal form ER diagrams and simply uh, map typically the, the kind of view of the data that you get naturally with a dimensional model and map that structure between the delivery system and the data warehouse. So there's a, 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 a sort of middleware layer that maps what the user sees on the screen, translates in, that into SQL or if those of you have heard of it, MDX, which is kind of similar to SQL but it's for dimensional structures and maps that onto the standard third normal form entity relationship structure in the data warehouse. So there is a design choice that we have about where we actually place um, that dimensional view, but there's fairly solid agreement that the dimensional view is um, the default, orthodox, um, effective way to present the, the data structure to the end users rather than the typical third normal form structure. So just to hark back to last week's uh, lecture where we talked about that uh, attempt to come up with a Monash method for data warehousing. Um, this is, if you recall, the kind of data warehousing process that we ended up with after talking to um, data warehouse practitioners and consultants and vendors and so on. Um, so I'm going to use this diagram over the next couple of weeks just to kind of structure the material that we're covering and say, look, this is, this is the bit of the data warehousing process that we're focusing on at the moment. So dimensional modelling fits in during the design phase, obviously, not too surprisingly, um, but importantly, it's, it's it's important to recognise that um, the decisions made during that design process, the design decisions made, affect just about everything in terms of use and operation of the, of the warehouse. Um, so it affects the design of the ETL process, obviously, if you're designing an ETL process to extract data from source systems and transform and load it into the data warehouse, then you've got to have somewhere, a, a structure for that data to go into. So design decisions made about that structure will affect the implementation of the ETL process during the data acquisition phase, um, how the data warehouse operates, how efficiently it can handle certain types of queries, um, how the warehouse deals with changes in business structure and, and so on. It's all going to be affected by the design of the structure, the data model, um, and the kinds of uh, delivery systems that we use and how the delivery system, the front end, interacts with the data warehouse is, is going to be very much impacted upon by the data structure in here. And as I said, it be because it becomes part of the user interface, it affects the use and the delivery system development as well. So these are really key design decisions that we're making. It's Again, it's kind of not a mistake to make a particular design decision and, and go with an entity relationship diagram at third normal form. It's not a mistake to do that, uh, but it does have consequences down the track. You will take a different design approach uh, during the, the um, delivery system development process and the use. Okay, does all of that make sense so far? All right, let's get into the, the dimensional modelling stuff. Now, for those of you who did 9003 and last semester was too long ago, this is what a third normal form ER diagram kind of looks like. Um, we'll use this as an example um, as, we, as we work our way through. Um, so you can see that there's information there about different 
business topics, particularly um, information about sales and customers and so on. And that information tends to be split across lots of different tables, or in this case, a couple of different tables. So you can see that there's customer information split across two tables there, product information split across two, um, store location, um, sort of geographical information is again split across two different tables there. Um, there's intersections of relationships between customers and regions and sales and customers and products and things like that. Um, now this is quite a simple ER diagram. Any real life uh, entity relationship model um, in a real live system is going to have hundreds and hundreds of entities. Um, that's just the, the nature of the third normal form process. You end up with lots and lots of entities. Um, in fact, uh, I've got a slide with some metrics on it in a second, so I'll talk about that when I get to it. Uh, but you can see the, the sort of inherent complexity. Here we're just talking about sales of products, and we've got lots and lots of tables, lots of relationships, and so on. So typically we normalise the third normal form, although all of my 9003 guys should be familiar with voice code normal form, fourth and fifth normal form. Um, but third normal form is typical, um, and the, the whole point of normalisation is to protect the database against certain types of data anomalies. Um, have I got, the, got it on the slide? No, I haven't. So does anyone remember from uh, learning about normalisation, what kinds of data anomalies does normalisation protect against? Did someone say insert? Yeah, uh, delete. Yeah, insert. Up. So any kind of changes that you make to the data. Um, so normalisation allows us to store each piece of information once and only once, hence the split across different tables, which means that if you're going to insert a brand new record, you can do it in one place. Um, if you need to edit that record, for example, if a customer changes their address, um, you only have to edit that customer address in one place. Um, if you decide to delete a customer for some reason, I'm not sure why you'd do that, but say you did decide to delete a customer, again, you only have to do it in one place rather than having repeating groups throughout tables that you have to go work your way through. Um, so the, the advantage of normalisation is that it makes any kind of data change uh, process very simple to implement. Um, it, it takes a lot of the processing load away from uh, the event of changing the data to the point of um, reading that data. So uh, the, the consequence of having that data split across multiple tables and the consequence that you saw in the tutorial last week is that you have to do lots of joins when you want to bring that data together. So normalisation shifts the processing load on the database server away from select type statements and put, sorry, normalisation shifts it to select type, type, type statements to make insert, update and delete statements a lot easier and quicker and more efficient to run. Now, with a data warehouse, what are the, what's the most common kind of uh, SQL transaction we perform against a data warehouse? Select. We, we want to read the data. So we've got a, a, a kind of system where um, the design requirement would suggest that we fine-tune for select statements rather than fine-tuning for uh, insert, update and delete statements. Um, the insert, update and delete happens during the ETL process and we can automate that as a, a fair bit. Um, and because it happens overnight, there's a bit of flexibility overnight or on, over the weekend during low processing loads. We can shift that, um, or we can make use of that uh, to make the ETL process a, a little bit more complex. There's limitations on that though, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so what we're trying... The design aim of normalisation doesn't fit the design requirements of data warehouses. So we can actually get away with significantly denormalising the data structures for a data warehouse because we don't need that efficiency of that protection against data anomalies for insert, update and delete. So just to drive the point home, in case you've forgotten all about normalisation, I'm sure you haven't, um, here's a, a very denormalised structure and if we're going to normalise that, you can see the repeating groups there, trolley is repeated. If we wanted to change the name of that um, product, uh, we'd have to change it four times and things like that. Um, that finding dependencies between primary keys and so on. And this is a normalised structure for that, for that data structure. So you can see you've gone from one table to three tables by normalising, and that creates a slightly more complex kind of table structure. But in a data warehouse environment, the benefits that this more complex data structure comes, uh, uh, delivers aren't really realised because data warehouses aren't used for those insert updates and deletes. So with a traditional database, um, these are the metrics I was kind of talking about. If you've got an ERP system like 
SAP. Um, I think the base install these days of SAP is 18,000 tables or entities. So you can imagine the data model for the base install of, of SAP. Um, throw into the mix the fact that SAP is a German company and their data model's in German. Um, you can see the, the problem. You wouldn't just give that to any, a managerial end user and say, well, here's, a, here's the data model. The data's all in there. Go nuts. Um, they would go nuts. They'd, they'd probably fire you. Um, in fact, the, the base install is, of SAP is 18,000 tables. The typical install, once you add on the, the most commonly used modules, is in the order of about 50,000 tables. Okay, so this is the level of complexity we're talking about with traditional transaction processing systems. It's a level of complexity that just, just doesn't work um, for business intelligence and decision support. Um, the advantage of ER modelling, and one of the real problems for teaching data warehousing, and um, I'm guessing some of you here have been practicing data, practicing data models in the past, um, and certainly I, I was a, a, a data modeller before I started doing data warehousing, um, and the, the hardest thing to do is to break those habits that you've picked up when you're designing ER models. Um, I don't, when I'm doing a, a database design, I don't think about normalisation or anything like that. My models come out normalised because I've been taught those kind of design patterns um, that produce nicely normalised uh, database structures. We have to break that kind of habit uh, for uh, designing data warehouses. So breaking that natural feel is, is probably the hardest thing that uh, data monitors have to go through when they, when they learn about data warehousing. And when I've taught this, this unit in the past, the people who've struggled the most with dimensional modelling have been people who are expert data modellers. Um, so if you're not an expert data modeller, <laughs> you're pretty well placed to learn this stuff. If you are, learn to break those habits of, of normalisation. Um, you're going to want to normalise your database structures. You don't need to. You need to keep in mind why we do normalisation and why it doesn't fit in a data warehousing kind of environment. The other thing is, as I was saying earlier, people don't understand ER models. Even uh, people who are trained to read data models and design data models don't understand other people's data models very well. And this is based on lots and lots of research um, in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, and even your own data models. I'm not sure how many of you have gone back and looked at some of your old data models that you've done in the past. Um, I've, I've done that myself, and after about a period of six months or so, the models make almost no sense. Um, you sort of wonder, why did I put, put it like this? Why did I structure things like this? Helps if you've got a good data dictionary to go back and read, read through. But um, once you start throwing in complex structures, and, and especially things like abstraction and generalisation and subtyping and, and exclusive or relationships and things like that, ER models are really not an effective way to... They're not an intuitive uh, structure to communicate... Uh, design ideas, and if, it's, if your warehouse is becoming part of the user interface, you're creating an interface that is hard to use, hard to understand, non-intuitive, and that's the opposite of what we want with decision support. Okay, I'm going to show you a short little video. The volume's not quite loud enough, really, is it? Hang on. That's a bit better. All right. So, for those of you who've done 9003, you've seen this video before. Um, I'm not sure whether the pod shows it in 5093. Um, you may do. Um, but this will refresh your memory. This is a, 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 a small demonstration by a company called Cognos, who is they're one of the, the key uh, business intelligence uh, software tools uh, used in decision support in organisations today. Um, Cognos got bought out by... IBM, that's right. I keep getting mixed up between Cognos and Business Objects. So it's now IBM Cognos, but this is before they were bought out by IBM. Back in the days when sort of uh, using web interfaces to do um, business intelligence was kind of brand new. Um, and this is their e-business solution for business intelligence. Um, so this is a marketing spiel. It's a pitch at a, um, at, the com at a Comdex conference, so an IT conference. Vendors trying to convince people to buy their product. So try to look past the marketing hype um, to get to the underlying idea of the vendor's perception of how end users are going to use their tools, but in particular focus on the, the, how the data structure comes through and appears in the user interface itself. Um, so sit back, it's only, it's only three or four minutes long, it's kind of a, I don't know, my irony meter goes way off uh, whenever I play this. I'm Annette and I'm the president of Wave Sound and Vision. We deliver uh, electronic goods over the web. And when I come into the office in the morning, the first thing I do is I log into my portal because I want to find out the big picture. I want to find out how my business is doing. So the first thing I do is I look at my sales and marketing because that's going to provide me with my, my big 
biggest picture, my overall view. So I'm going to look at my gross profit analysis by channel. And when that chart comes up, I can see very easily that my e-commerce channel is doing very well. I've got all my channels, my direct sales, my mail order, that type of thing, my telesales. But it's e-commerce that's doing really well. So now that I've seen that e-commerce is doing so well, I want to have a look at who's buying on my website and what are they buying. So why don't we look at the customer profiles and my product interest on my website report. So I can see very quickly here that my accessories line is... Take close attention to those drop-down boxes. My accessories line has cables, connectors, batteries, that type of thing. So it makes sense that those low-touch items are actually moving over my website. But what I'm really interested in is my sites line. Now those are my DVDs, my stereos, my camcorders, I guess. And this is the type of an item that you actually, you kind of need to experience it, don't you, before you purchase it over the website. It's interesting to me that those sell so well. So here we can see it's actually my flat panel TVs have sold the most. So let's have a look in there. And here's my four types of flat panel TVs. And I'm going to change to the region dimension so that I can see where they're selling. So you can see that the stuff that we had in the ER diagram, the region table, the store table, that's kind of embedded in the user interface there. We can change our, our view of the data. World's best pie chart. the age of who's buying these flat panel TVs over my website. So it's my 30 to 39 year olds. And now I want to find out the gender. So I'll have you isolate that and then change the dimension to gender so I can find out exactly who is buying these. All right, so it's males. Well, that's not rocket science. I have a lot of males, 30 to 39 years old, buying my flat panel TVs. That makes sense. But what's interesting to me is that they're doing it over the internet. So let's drill through for some more information so maybe I can determine why this is happening. So now what's going to come up is a report that shows me that, in fact, I ran an e-marketing campaign. It was called Big Screen for Big Boys. And we ran that in New York. It was highly successful. So now I can take that information, run that same campaign maybe in California or Illinois, somewhere else, and it'll probably be successful. But what's also interesting about this report is at the end here, I can see that we've had a lot of those flat panel TVs returned. And the reason that people are returning them is because there's a bad chip problem. So could you find out which supplier is supplying you with those bad chips? So now I'm pulling up a new supplier scorecard. It's going to give me information about my suppliers and how much return quantity I'm getting, how much damage quantity is coming in. And I can see here across my product types that it's actually, I've got some red and yellow swatches above the sites line to show me that it's coming in below the threshold that I've set. And that makes sense because the sites line is where the flat panel TVs were coming from. So if you can drill in on my sites line, I'd like to determine who are my suppliers for my sites line. And I have three of them. But the one that's doing really poorly is CyberTech Corporation. They've given me a lot of damage quantity recently. So if you could drill in on that, I'll see if there's more information behind that. So now I can see that actually CyberTech has been supplying me with damage quantity. I knew that already, but a lot of it has been coming in the fourth quarter. So I'm pretty upset about this. I'm getting a lot of returns. That's not good business. So what should I do with my supplier? Well, I could easily go out and choose another supplier. But in fact, we've had a long-standing relationship with CyberTech. So what I'm going to choose to do instead is to share this information with them, give them a chance. So if you could publish that report, please, into uh, the CyberTech's news box. What I'm doing now is I'm dumping that report into a news box, and I've allowed CyberTech, my supplier, to come in to, through the extranet and cross my firewall to get this report so they can see, okay, we've been supplying damage, damaged goods. Maybe they can enhance their, their chip. They can do something to strengthen the relationship that we have going on. Okay, so as Annette mentioned, I'm coming back, assuming the role of the supply chain manager for CyberTech Corporation, who is a supplier for Wave. So, we go to Wave's homepage, and I'm going to log in as CyberTech into the extranet, where they're sharing their corporate information with me as one of their business partners. So, you'll notice when the portal comes up that it's a very comfortable environment for me. They've customized it with my colors and my logo, so it's all my look and feel. Now, I'm going to take a look at my CyberTech news box and see if there's any new reports. And there is, and there's one that's damaged quantities, so that doesn't sound very good. I better take a look at that. I guess I've been sending them a lot of damaged components, especially in Q4 of last year. I can see that almost half of my pie chart here is damaged components from the most recent quarter. And I know that's not acceptable. My competition is only a click away, so who's to say Wave isn't just going to pick up a new supplier? Now, I know we've had a long relationship with Wave, so I appreciate them sharing this information with me so that I have a chance to do something about it. But I just need some more detail first. I'm going to have to know which component it is that's defective. So if I look at my component failure report, which they've also shared with me, this is from Wave. And they're trying to tell me that the V-chip in their flat panel TVs is failing. So what I need to do as a supply chain manager is go back to production.
production and shipping of this component, and we've got to start manufacturing something that's going to be successful in their flat panel TVs. Because if Wave can be successful as a company, then CyberTech can be successful as a company, and that's what strong e-business relationships are about. Now, I'm just going to summarize for you what we've shown you. At Ed and I have shown you the Cognos Enterprise Business Intelligence Solution for e-business. What we've done is shown you how two companies, Wave and CyberTech, have been able to make better decisions and build stronger and better e-business relationships by using our EBI solution for e-business. And they've done that through seeing, uniting, and sharing their business. Cognos has what it takes to make you e-business winners. <laughs> Excellent. I want to be an e-business winner. Um, <laughs> There's quite a lot in there about um, sort of the vendor's perspective on, on how um, business are, or how they think business people use their tools, which is completely unrealistic. Um, and this presentation, I don't, I don't want to pick on Cognos at all. This is typical of all of the vendors, and this was uh, this is about ten years old now. Their pitch hasn't changed. Um, so the idea that you know uh, Wave would some manager in Wave would be looking through data and going, oh, there's a problem with the supplier, so I'll create a little report and put it in their inbox and Maybe they'll read it, maybe they won't. Um, if they're you know, a major supplier of a major component of a major um, product that they sell, you'd think they'd pick up the phone and talk to Wave. Anyway, completely unrealistic. But the point of showing you guys this video, apart from exposing you to a bit of the, the vendor marketing hype that you need to build up an immunity to, um, is the idea that the, the data structure is embedded in that user interface. Um, all of the interaction in the, the tool is about clicking on data and taking, navigating from one report to another report, from one view of the data to another view of the data. Um, and it's the data structure that allows that, that um, movement through the information space. So the fact that they were able to change their view of the pie chart from um, a product view to a view of um, gender, so they could see who was buying their particular products, um, there's a data structure in, in the data warehouse that, uh, that classifies sales according to gender or classifies sales according to product um, and things like that. So the data structure comes through the user interface and typically it's the structure around uh, the report where the data structure itself is. The data itself is kind of in the middle of the report, so the values in the pie chart, the values in the tables and so on. Um, this is much more, a, a much different kind of user interface to what you're typically going to find with a transaction processing system, where you've got a predefined workflow, there's a, a series of steps, usually data entry or something like that, and you structure the form on the screen in, in such a way that it makes it most efficient to get that data into, um, into the system. With a data warehouse, the usage pattern is completely different. It's exploratory, it's unpredictable, and as I've been saying, the, the data structure comes through and it's embedded in the user interface. A complex data structure is going to lead to a complex user interface. Um, a poorly designed data structure is going to restrict how the users are able to explore the information space. So we want to come up with a design um, that allows for this exploratory um, kind of decision support. Um, as I said earlier, there's, it's not uncommon for data warehouse developers to still use the traditional ER modelling approach to designing data warehouses. Um, personally, I'm more of a dimensional modelling um, advocate, um, hence it's, it's in, the, in the course. But it's something that if you are going to work in data warehousing, you need to be familiar with the concept of dimensional modelling anyway. I assume you're all familiar with ER modelling, um, so uh, this is why we, we cover it in, in the course. Even though there's sort of almost an ideological opposition from, from some developers to dimensional modelling. So dimensional modelling is, as I've hinted, a way of defining the information space that a user can navigate through. Um, by adding structural features to the design, we can allow the users to change their view of the data, view the data from a number of different perspectives, um, and hopefully allow the users to understand, explore and learn about the decision problems, learn about the business so they can make better, more effective decisions. And that's the key to data warehousing. If we, whenever we lose sight of that kind of end result, we end up focusing on the data or data quality or trying to get the ETL process to work. None of that matters if we're not providing um, an improvement to the decision-making capabilities of the organisation. So we've got to keep that uppermost in our mind um, at all times. So the dimensional modelling approach, or multi-dimensional approach, just means the same thing. I usually say dimensional modelling because it's easier to roll off the tongue than multi-dimensional modelling. Um, it's a way of structuring the, the database design that encourages um, exploration. And it's based on the idea that um, data is described by a number of different attributes. So each 
sort of number that appears in a database, a quantitative value, um, only makes sense when you take it into in context of a number of different descriptive elements. So, for example, the number 23.76 doesn't mean anything unless you know that it happens to be um, the dollar value of sales of a particular product in a particular store with a particular transaction. So those useful bits of information describe the number 23.76 or whatever it was that I said. Um, so the idea is that each number um, is described by what it measures, the point of time that it was created. Time turns out to be quite an important um, element of, of dimensional modelling. Um, the location, um, etc., etc. It's when that information is included with the, the, uh, the more quantitative data that you actually start to get insight into the organisation, into the business problem. So multidimensional models are based on this, this metaphor of an information space and the idea that uh, numbers are described by um, usually qualitative textual labels and attributes and so on. Um, sometimes modelers will talk about hypercubes or n cubes. It's just another way of saying multidimensional models. Um, the idea of talking about a cube, though, um, is, is quite common. For those of you who have used Microsoft's reporting services or analysis services, um, or even, say, simple pivot charts in Excel, um, you'll notice that Microsoft talk about cubes, data cubes and things like that. That's what they're talking... This is the kind of structure they're talking about with, with cube. A cube is a multidimensional structure. Now, a cube implies that it's a three-dimensional structure, and typically our dimensional models include a lot more than just three dimensions. Um, so the, the term cube can be a little bit misleading, um, hence the, the term hypercube or n cube, because we have more than three dimensions in our cube. Um, the disadvantage with the metaphor is that when you start talking about cubes, um, when you start talking to end users, they sit down with the tool and they look at the kind of um, video, uh, the kind of screens that we just saw in the video, and they go, "Well, where's the cube? The cube's not there. It's the structure around the outside of the, the reports. Really, it's a, um, a a better way of thinking about." Uh, this dimensional structure and communicating it to business users is that it's a structure that allows you to slice and dice um, and move from one report template to another report template, change your view of the data um, and the, uh, simply by either clicking or changing some of the parameters of the report. Um, so I find that it, it actually makes more sense when you talk to business users and use the term parameterized reporting than dimensional structures because they expect to see a cube. Um, and they, you, they often don't. Um, so that can be confusing. Anyway, that's kind of a little bit beside the point. The main aim of the dimensional structure is to allow you to take different slices of the data, view the data from different perspectives, and essentially the delivery system construction involves designing a number of different report templates and then allowing the tool, the user, to define the data that ends up being displayed in that template. Um, so whether it's the pie chart interface that we saw in the video or that... Um, a column chart with uh, coloured swatches down the bottom. Um, the delivery system designer, the BI developer, is concerned with constructing a series of report templates, linking them together, and then allowing the user to click through and change the parameters to fill the content of those reports um, as required. Okay, so a couple of important terms, report templates, slicing and dicing. Uh, we'll talk about slicing and dicing in a second. So let's start by trying to wrap our minds around this idea of an information space. It took me about three or four weeks before the light bulb went off in my head when I first learned about dimensional modelling and went, oh, of course, it makes complete sense now. Um, so it's a particular way of thinking. Some people naturally think in this kind of geometric kind of way, um, think spatially. Um, other people tend to think in a more um, textual kind of way. I'm more of a textual kind of person. It took me a while to wrap my minds around it. Um, so if you don't get it straight away, don't worry too much. Um, it will click eventually. Anyway, let's start off with a very, very simple, probably the most simple uh, dimensional model you can have, a, a one-dimensional data structure. So, here we go. Here's a one-dimensional data structure. Um, as you can see, you can move through this data structure only in one dimension. You can move left or right to change your view of the data. You can't move up and down. You can't move backwards and forwards. It's only one dimension. So we've got here, you know, data that's uh, sales in uh, thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands of dollars? Um, thousands of dollars. Um, so $12,000, $8,000 worth of uh, widgets sold in different years. So we can change the view of the year. We can look at 2002 data. We can look at 2006 data. But we can't look at anything other than widgets, and we can't look at anything other than sales. So this is a, an information space that has one dimension. Is everyone OK so far? Apart from Banji, who's dying from hay fever. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so let's let's step onto two dimensions. Okay, so now we've got we've added a product dimension. So we had a time dimension before. We can move through time. Now we can actually change our view of the different products. So we can say um, sales of flanges in 2002. We can look at sales of widgets in 2007. Sales of hinges in 2005. Um, so we can change our view of the data in two directions now. We can change our view of products, we can change our view of time. Everyone's okay so far? Alrighty. Three dimensions. We've added a uh, geographic dimension here, or a location dimension. So we can look at all of the things we looked at before, but now we can change our view from Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Brisbane, and so on. So we now have this sort of three-dimensional cube structure. We can move through that, we can find different individual pieces of data. Um, it's a bit hard to extend the illustration beyond three dimensions because it's hard to represent three dimensions, uh, four or five dimensions. Um, but keep in mind that most typical dimensional models have six, seven, twenty dimensions perhaps. Um, but they all work in the same way by adding an extra degree of freedom to allow you to move through an information space or allow the user to move through uh, that information space. So is everyone comfortable with three dimensions? Okay. So let's talk about slicing and dicing then. So imagine we've got this three-dimensional structure and we want to do some reports. I've, I've talked about looking up individual numbers. So for example, sales of sprockets in 2005 in Melbourne was $13,000 $13, worth. Um, however, typically you're not looking for one number. You're looking for perhaps um, all sales in Melbourne or all sales of flanges across regions and time. Um, so what we often do with reporting is we take slices of the queue, and that becomes the content of the report. So here we've got uh, sales of all products for just 2004. So we've taken this vertical slice uh, through the data. Um, here we've taken, over here we've got taken a horizontal slice by saying, um, let's look at sales of nuts in, across each location and across uh, each time uh, frame that we've got. So you can slice and dice the, the cube to produce different sets of reports. All by simply changing the uh, parameters of the report. So for example, oh, which are the coordinates of the information space. So here, we could very easily look at the 2005 slice by simply changing the parameter for 2004, change that to 2005, and bang, we've got this slice instead. Can you want to see how the SQL might work for this? No, it's a bit hard when you haven't got sort of a relational table structure, but um, the 2004 would probably be part of the where clause, so where year equals 2004. And if we wanted to change to a different slice, we just say where year equals 2005. So the SQL becomes quite simple against this kind of structure. What we haven't done yet is shown how this structure can map onto a relational database structure, which consists of, by definition, a whole series of two-dimensional tables. Okay. So, if you're comfortable with three dimensions, you should be comfortable with higher dimensions as we go, as we go further. Um, a typical dimensional model will maybe have 10 to 15 dimensions. Just, this is just sort of rule of thumb, typical generic kind of uh, dimensional models. Um, most users don't see all of those dimensions. So it's, it's possible with um, the delivery systems or even the database man management system to create customised views for different users, or different user groups. Um, most users will typically say, see about six to seven dimensions, um, largely because that's cognitively the amount, number of structures that we can deal with. You know, that kind of rule of thumb of seven plus or minus two um, in terms of user interface design. Um, so it naturally kind, kind of comes out at about six to seven dimensions, typically. Um, most BI systems, most data warehousing systems, might have, say, 20 different customised views for different um, user groups, and perhaps four to five different dimensional models making up the overall data structure. Um, so your data warehouse doesn't have to consist of just one dimensional model. You can actually have several dimensional models, several related dimensional models. Um, I'll talk about facts in a second, the difference between facts and dimensions. Um, but those are kind of the numbers that we're looking at, the level of complexity that you typically find with a uh, dimensional model. Now I mentioned a second ago, oh, about 30, seconds, uh, 30 minutes ago, um, that there's a design decision we have to make about where that dimensional view of the data ends up being implemented. Now it's quite possible to uh, implement it in the data warehouse itself. Um, so we can, we can come up with a relational database structure that in, 
that naturally embodies that dimensional structure that we've designed. Or we can have a third normal form ER uh, structure in the data warehouse and have a middleware layer that maps that uh, ER structure to a dimensional structure so that what the end users see is exactly the same thing. They still see a dimensional structure, um, but it's simply mapped from one to the other. If we implement it here in the warehouse itself, then the mapping occurs during the ETL process because the source systems are typically in third normal form ER. So we have to map the source systems to a dimensional structure if we're implementing it here. Or if we're implementing it here, then the mapping occurs at this layer. It's a design decision. The implications are that um, if you do the mapping here, then the reporting might be a little bit slower at this end. Whereas if you implement it here, the reporting will be fairly fast because the structures have already been mapped, the sort of, uh, summary values are being pre-calculated, we'll talk about summaries in, in a little bit. Um, but your ETL process might take longer to run because it's more complex. Okay, so design decision to make. Um, what we're going to talk about, uh, or the assumption we'll make for the rest of the lecture is that it's being implemented in the enterprise, in the data warehouse itself, in the physical data structure. Okay, a little bit of terminology just to bring you up to speed with what you're going to find with the vendors. Um, OLAP is the sort of industry jargon for this idea of presenting dimensional structures to end users and allowing them to slice and dice and navigate through. The kind of uh, tool that we saw in the video would be called an OLAP tool um, by a lot of vendors. Um, OLAP is a kind of industry standard. It was uh, developed or popularised by a guy called EF Cod. Uh, for those of you who've done a bit of database theory, you'll uh, recall that COD uh, in basically invented the relational uh, database paradigm. Um, so COD was responsible for popularising relational database management systems, and today just about every database management system that, that is used in industry is a relational database management system. So that, that happened in the early 80s, and COD thought he'd have another crack at it in the 1990s for business intelligence type databases, and thought, OK, OLAP is, is how I'm going to uh, you know, make my name again. It's going to be the new relational uh, kind of approach. So COD wrote a white paper for um, an organisation known as the OLAP Council, which is basically a, a group of vendors who were trying to sell OLAP type products. Um, and whereas COD kind of revolutionised relational databases or database management systems in the 80s, didn't have quite the same level of impact um, on uh, OLAP systems, largely because the vendors already had tools that were basically OLAP anyway, um, and they were paying him to write the white paper. So you know, it was a bit of a cart before the horse kind of thing. But um, the terminology did stick, the idea of OLAP being a dimensional structure and, and, and so on. OLAP stands for Online Analytical Processing. Now, the different ways that you implement OLAP, that OLAP view that I just talked about a second ago with that, that diagram earlier, um, lead to different flavours of OLAP. So um, you end up with this acronym soup kind of situation. Um, the term ROLAP refers to relational OLAP, which is what we're going to talk about uh, today. The idea of using a relational database to implement an OLAP type structure, a dimensional structure. Um, there is such a thing as HOLAP, called, which stands for hybrid OLAP. Um, hybrid OLAP is where you have a, a bit of a mixture of, of the two. Um, so you have a, 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 a partly normalised uh, data, data warehouse and the delivery system does a lot of the mapping to create that OLAP type um, experience. There's also uh, COLAP, which is communications based OLAP. Um, there's also JOLAP, which is Java based OLAP. Um, there's MOLAP, which is pure multi-dimensional OLAP, which is where you use a multi-dimensional database management system for the warehouse. Um, there's I think at least 26 uh, variations on the term OLAP. Um, they all just mean creating that multi-dimensional view, that multi-dimensional experience for the end users. So don't worry too much, but just keep in mind that there are different ways of implementing that view. You can either do it in the delivery system or in the warehouse or a mixture of both, and there's lots of different technologies that, that can help you out um, along the way. So what we're going to talk about now is how you do ROLAP, how you implement a dimensional structure, a dimensional model, a dimensional conceptual model in a rela physical relational database management system. Okay. And to do that, we use a, a, a particular kind of entity relationship diagram called a star schema. So a star schema is an approach that allows us to do, well, MOLAP or, um, sorry, not MOLAP, um, to do ROLAP. Um, it allows us to use the technology that's typically in place already in an organisation. We don't have to go to the expense of buying a brand new 
kind of uh, database management system. We don't need a multi-dimensional database management system to, to build a data warehouse. They are available, they are on the market, but they cost lots and lots of money because they don't sell a lot of product. Um, and the skill base, uh, the, the people who can actually uh, use these kinds of tools is very, very small. Compared to the kinds of skill base that you have for a typical relational database management system, the ability to find someone who knows, for example, SQL Server back to front, it's very, very easy. They're a dime a dozen. Um, SQL Server itself is pretty cheap to buy. Um, Oracle, same kind of thing. Oracle's a bit more expensive to purchase, but you know you can sort of open a window and throw a rock and you'll hit an Oracle developer. Um, so it's easy to find the talent, easy to find the skills to, to utilise the relational database management system. So star schemas are a really useful tool because we can still have this conceptual dimensional model, but a physical, a logical or a physical um, ER or relational database structure that still provides the same benefits. Um, so we can still use our cheap, um, ubiquitous database management systems. So star schemas are actually quite easy to do. Um, the key thing to keep in mind is that a star, well, a multi-dimensional model is not necessarily a star schema. It's the difference between conceptual and logical and physical. Um, so keep that in mind. A lot of students, when they're writing their exams, and I might have a question on the exam about dimensional models, assume I'm talking about star schemas. There's, there is a difference, so keep, keep that difference in mind. Um, so star schemas are actually quite easy to construct, assuming you've done your conceptual dimensional model. So there's still that design effort that has to go into coming up with a dimensional structure, same as any other kind of uh, data modelling process. But once you've got that dimensional model in mind, it's quite simple to turn that into uh, one of these star schemas. Essentially, each dimension of the dimensional structure, the things around the outside of the cube, the edges of the cube become what are known as dimension tables. So you create a, a table for each dimension. So whereas we had a three-dimensional structure earlier with, what was it? It was time, product, and location. In our star schema to support that dimensional structure, we would have three dimension tables, one for each of those uh, dimensions. We would also have a fourth table uh, that sits in the centre of our structure and gives kind of gives the name of uh, star schema that holds the actual data itself. Um, often referred to as the fact table. It contains the facts in our uh, dim dimensional structure and the dimension tables describe those facts, add meaning to the facts. Um, so our fact table before was sales in uh, thousands of dollars. Um, so each dimension becomes a table. The content of the cube also becomes a table called a fact table. And each dimension table is related to the fact table with a one-to-many relationship, mandatory one to optional many. Um, so where we, our centre of fact table was sales, and we had a product table, a, lo a region, no, a city table, and a time table, perhaps a year table, it might be easier to, to uh, visualise. Each sale will be for one product, must be for one product, must be in one city, and in one year. But each year may have many sales. Each product may have many sales in each. So it's, it's one mandatory one to optional many. Um, and the key to making this structure work really efficiently is to give the fact table a primary key that is made up purely of the foreign keys from the dimension tables. Okay, so the fact table has a composite key or a concatenated key, depending on how you implement it, that consists purely of the foreign keys from the dimension tables. So remember always, the, when you've got a one-to-many relationship, the primary key comes from the one end, appears as a foreign key at the many end, we create the, the primary key for that fact table from the uh, foreign keys. And that allows us to construct very, very simple SQL queries, um, similar to the kinds of queries that you saw um, in last week's tutorial. So that we can change our slice of the data that we're looking at simply by changing the primary key, the, sorry, the foreign key value from the dimension tables. So if we want to look at 2004, we use the 2004 primary key to search the fact table. If we want to look at 2005, we just make one very simple change to the where clause. In fact, it's so simple that it all becomes automated. So the delivery system tools are essentially tools that translate the user's clicks and selections from drop-down boxes and, and so on into SQL code that gets executed against the warehouse. Data comes back and the report appears. So the users don't have to touch SQL at all. If they want to roll up their sleeves and do a bit of SQL, so if they do have some technical skills, the SQL is really, really simple. There's no complex uh, joins. 
because the star schema consists of a centralised fact table and lots of dimension tables, the deepest join that you have to do is one. So there's only one join, uh, one step of join. So you don't have these nested joins that, uh, for those of you who did 9003, remember those nested tables and multiple, multiple joins that you had to do? Don't have to do that at all with data warehousing. So, and that all works because of the selection of the primary key for the fact table. So it runs really, really fast. Um, it runs a lot faster than running a complex SQL query against um, a normalised structure. For those of you who sort of counted the time that went through with running the queries from last week's tutorial, how long did the, the normalised structure r roughly take to run? This was Microsoft Access, so it was, you know, kind of clunky, but it was in the order of, say, three or four seconds or so for, for that SQL to execute. And then for the star schema structure, the SQL, it was kind of like that. Um, so you can see that there's efficiencies to pick up. A lot of that efficiency came from the fact that the star schema structure was a lot smaller than the transaction processing system. The reason for that was that the values were all summed together rather than individual transactions, so the, the volume was smaller. But even so, even with the same volume data to, to, tra to traverse, these kind of star schema structures lead to SQL, which is fine-tuned for select rather than fine-tuned for insert, update and delete. Okay, so let's have a look at some diagrams. This is our diagram we had earlier with uh, sales information, so customer types, customer region, store, etc., etc. This is the same model structured according to a star schema instead. So you can see why it's called a star schema. You've got the centralised table and then dimension tables around the outside. Um, but it leads to a data structure that's intuitive for business users to understand because you can quite clearly see that it's about sales. So it's a business structure, business topic. And if you remember the Inmon and Hackathon definition we had from week one, subject-oriented, integrated, non-volatile, time-variant. This is a subject-oriented perspective, whereas this is not a subject-oriented perspective. This is a, an efficient data perspective, but this is cl quite clearly subject-oriented. Um, You'll notice, though, that the data that was normalised in the previous diagram is now being squeezed into single tables. So the product table, which was normalised into product type and individual products, is now collapsed into a denormalised product table. So we have repeating groups in the product table. Um, the customer uh, table, again, has been denormalised to provide a single table, and same with store. Um, but that's okay, because we're not worried about insert, update, and delete anomalies. We're more concerned with getting data out of this structure as quickly and as efficiently as possible and creating an intuitive, easy to navigate user interface as a result. So you can see that around the outside we've got these dimension tables. They're kind of like master files. They're kind of the data that, um, say, a middle level manager might have printed out on an A4 page in their drawer. So lists of customers, lists of stores, and things like that. Um, the fact table tends to be very, very big the bulk of the data tends to sit in the fact table in the data warehouse. So the centre table becomes really quite large, you know, gigabytes or terabytes in worth of, worth of size, whereas the dimension tables are often measured in, say, kilobytes or megabytes um, in size. They're a lot smaller. Um, but the fact table consists of usually quantitative data. That's the content of that dimensional structure, um, the values that populate the reports that the end users uh, end up seeing. Um, typically, also, we don't put in the optionality and cardinality with the relationship lines uh, with our dimensional uh, models because they're all exactly the same. So I've shown them here, but typically it's just a line. Um, now, how do the attributes work? Kind of looks like this. So you'll notice that we've got the dimension tables all have to have a primary key. So that's pretty straightforward. If you've got your dimensional structure, if you've worked out what the dimensions are, and what the dimensions describe, you've already got the table structure and the primary keys of the dimension tables and therefore the primary key of the <coughs> central fact table as well. Um, but some interesting things to note about the actual attributes, the non-key attributes themselves. In the dimension tables, the attributes contain the um, kind of attributes about those dimensions. So things, if you're talking about a customer, their customer name, their customer type, their address, their gender, uh, maybe the date of birth or age range and so on. Um, store information, the address, the region, you might even have, say, the manager's name of the store, or maybe a contact number for the store and things like that. So kind of the typical attributes you'd expect for those kinds of entities. 
But for the fact table, it's a little bit different. The attributes are actually quite special. The attributes in the fact table reflect what are known as the measures of the facts, or measured facts. So it's fairly intuitive to understand that this structure is about sales, but any business user can tell you that there's lots of different ways of measuring sales from a quantitative perspective. We can measure sales in terms of dollar sales. We can measure sales in terms of unit sales. Um, we might even measure sales in terms of profit or loss or profitability margin, things like that. So lots of, with, and this is the case with most fact tables. There's often multiple ways of measuring um, those facts. So each measure that we want to keep in our structure becomes an attribute in the fact table. So here we're measuring dollar sales and unit sales. Um, but that's kind of different, a different way of thinking to the attributes for the dimension tables. Yes? The, the, remember the, the last two bits of Inmon and Hackathon's uh, definition, non-volatile time variant, particularly the non-volatile. Um, so if the product type changes, and that it does happen um, quite often, actually, and it's quite a common thing to happen, we don't want to erase history. We want to keep the historical product types around. Um, but we can fairly easily map onto the create new product types within the ETL process. Um, the tricky thing is being able to maintain the current product type structure. And it might be more than just product type. You might have a whole hierarchy of things like um, brand, line, type, and things like that. Um, we can change that kind of structure. But the tricky thing is, is keeping it consistent with the historical one as well. Next week, we'll look at how we, we can do that. It's called um, a slowly changing dimension. Um, and there's a couple of different strategies for handling it. So we'll, we'll talk about that next week, but it's, you're on the right track. Um, but we don't want to delete history. We want to keep that, that old stuff around over time. But remember, the change happens when we run the ETL process, and that happens on an infrequent basis. So it's not like a transaction processing system where we're concerned about making sure that data entry happens really quickly, that it's efficient, efficiently processed within you know, 0.1 of a second so that the user experience stays the same. The user experience that we're trying to support is a reporting experience. So the select statements, uh, it's much more important for extracting data to be efficient than for putting data in to be efficient, which is why we denormalise. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so for example, a particular product, the mm. product, Mm -hmm. rather than the essence of you know, a very product. Yeah, so it's still the same product, but it's just categorised differently. That's correct. Yeah. So, yeah. so there are strategies for, for handling that over time. So, yeah. Yeah. How, how do we decide to keep the table more to start Well, <laughs> typically you're not talking about one table. You're talking about maybe 10, 15 different source systems that might be feeding into the data warehouse. What you do is you don't start by looking at the source systems and say, OK, I need to cram all this data into the data warehouse. Um, a data warehouse isn't about consolidating the entire organization's data in one place. What you're trying to do is improve decision making in the organization. So rather than coming out from the source system saying, here's the data we've got, you start at the user's perspective and say, well, what decisions are they making? What information do they need to make their decisions? And work your way back. So what's an efficient structure, what's a useful structure for supporting that decision making? Design that structure like this, and then look at the source system and say, well, how do we populate that structure? Where does the data come from? So rather than going from source system forward, you design from the user back. Well, again, it, it comes from what the users require. So you talk to the users, what information do they need to make their decisions better, um, and then design accordingly. Now, of course, you could end up with a situation where you've identified a requirement, you've designed something, and you go, oh, there's no data. We can't, can't do that. So there is a, a, a compromise process. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't be driven by what's available. You shouldn't be thinking, right, I need to shovel as much data into the data warehouse as, as possible. It's got to come from the other side. Yep. Don't worry. Yeah. 
Yeah, a, a typical warehouse might have, say, four or five, and they can actually share dimensions. So you might find multiple fact tables, um, and they may, for example, share a product dimension or a time dimension, but they're just different perspectives of those things. Um, the, when you have it, models that share dimensions, the term to refer to those dimensions is a conformed dimension. It basically just means that it's the same dimension table um, shared across uh, different uh, fact tables. You often find, though, that even though intuitively it makes sense that, yes, they share the dimension tables, the nature of the fact table, the nature of the analysis that the fact table is trying to support often means that you might end up with a slightly different version of the dimension table. So they're not strictly shared. Um, but yes, you, you end up with multiples in the, in the warehouse itself. It depends on the scale and scope of the warehouse too, though. Some warehouses are designed, um, called an enterprise data warehouse, designed for the entire organisation. So you end up with lots and lots of these star schemas. Others, which we call data marts, which are smaller scaled um, data warehouses, usually aimed at a more homogenous group of users. So it might be a, a business unit of, say, five or six users. They may only have, say, one or two fact tables. Um, so it depends on the scale and scope. But yes, certainly it's quite possible to have multiples of these base model, base structures, and yeah, they can share their dimension tables too. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. So in this case where the business is changed, mm -hmm. um, so new new requirements come to the the DW. Mm -hmm. so, so we base on the new requirement to capture a new set of data from the source data. Yep. Uh, source system. So in this case maybe um so there is two periods of the design, right? So one is maybe additional information for those parts where we come to previous one and the new one mm. uh, are related. So in this case, for the time step, maybe uh, for the new one, I just can capture, capture this, uh, the last three years, but the old one, I have the last five years. So yep. the data is up the same, maybe it comes to the report, maybe I need to use both of the mm. data. Maybe, yeah, it's a data quality issue. It can be, but the, the real thing which you've kind of touched on, the real problem, it's not just two cycles. This is happening within an evolutionary development process. There is no kind of end to, to the requirements changing over time. So what you need is a data structure that's adaptable over time, that's flexible enough to um, be changed as requirements change uh, down the track. Now, advocates of third normal form ER modelling approach argue that their approach is actually more adaptable and more flexible because they're capturing typically the transactional data Whereas in these structures, we're typically summarising and aggregating the data. So for example, here, dollar sales and unit sales typically refers to all of those values for a given day, rather than the individual transactions with a timestamp. Um, so the advantage of this is that you end up with smaller data structure, because instead of having, say, thousands of transactions, you've got one value to represent those thousands of transactions per day. Um, but that may mean that the structure is not flexible as requirements change down the track. So you, it's an it's ongoing problem for the designer to keep the design of the warehouse up to date with requirements. Even though the third normal form proponents make this argument that their structures are more flexible and adaptable, um, what we typically see in practice is that the lifespan of a given data warehouse, a given BI implementation, tends to be a lot shorter than the lifespan of a transaction processing system. So I've, I've seen banks, for example, that are still using transaction processing systems that were developed in the 1960s. Um, so these things can live on and on and on. Typically written in COBOL and, you know, there's... Yeah. Um, so if, if you're a COBOL programmer, there's lots of uh, business for you to, to be had in, um, in, in banks. You get paid a lot of money. Um, but the typical lifespan for a data warehouse is maybe three years because of that continuous change. The, the business changes, the source systems change, and eventually you reach a point where the change is so great that you can't adapt the data model. You simply go, right, let's start with a clean slate. We'll redesign for the new requirements. Um, and so whilst that ha happens even with the ER modelling 
uh, style data warehouses too. So the, the counter argument to the sort of ER modeling advocates who say our models are more flexible is that, well, the system's going to be turned off down the, in about three years' time anyway. Um, much better to create a better user experience um, and therefore hopefully more effective decisions as a result of that than, you know, that kind of data modelist, modeling purist approach of a third normal form ER structure. That's just going to change anyway. Um, but yeah, look, it's, it's a constant tension as the requirements change, the design has to change um, over time as well. Um, but, and you know, but you can bolt things on. You can use you know baling wire and duct tape metaphorically, and and change the structure a bit. And then you start getting the situations you just talked about, where you're trying to get data from one structure and another structure at the same time, and then you've got another layer on top to kind of do the mapping across of those things, and you end up with this spaghetti structure that no one really understands, no one's able to maintain, um, and you know, heaven forbid, it becomes a, a mission critical system that you can't turn off to fix up. Um, there's one um, system I saw in a, one of the major banks, I won't say which one, but it was one of the big, the big four. They had a, a data warehouse system that was maybe 10 years old, and they bolted on so many adaptations to the data structure over time that literally there was no one who, there was no one person who understood the data structure and it understood the warehouse and how it operated, but it had become mission critical. If that system went down, the bank wouldn't be able to trade, so they'd have to close their doors. Um, so they, they were living in absolute terror that something would just go wrong. And as a result, their data quality kept dropping, getting worse and worse. Um, they couldn't replace the data structure because they couldn't turn the system off. Um, it was a real, I'm not sure how they solved it in the end, but um, it was a real problem for them. Yeah. Well, the data is captured by somewhere. Um, so the, there's not too many organisations that don't have an OLTP system. Um, by the nature of business, there's transactions that occur. Um, there's not too many businesses that don't have a transaction. Um, you know, I, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but all businesses have some kind of transaction and typically have a, an, a computerised information system to keep records of those transactions. Um, that being said, a data warehouse isn't necessarily just fed by internal OLTP systems. There might be external data that's fed in to supplement that information. It really depends on the nature of the, de the decision requirements of the decision users. Sorry? Several OLTPs are also there? Possibly, yeah. Um, one one um, uh, motivation that a lot of organisations, that a lot of data warehousing projects have is that um, the organisations merge with another organisation. So there's now two organisations coming together as one and they see the data warehouse as a way of bringing that, the data from their previous systems together in, in one location. Um, but you might even have data coming from uh, commercial data providers. So for example, you might have a marketing database provided by one of those third party customer data collectors, you know, people who run the flyby scheme and credit card companies and things like that. You might have stock price information coming from the stock exchange uh, being supplemented. So it's what information does the, do the users need to make better decisions? Often that's data about how the organisation's going. So typically that will come from a transaction processing system, but it might be external data as well. Yeah. So this is why you've got to start from the user end rather than the source system end when you're designing designing the house. Okay, so this is this is your classic star schema. Fact table in the middle, dimension tables around the outside. Um, if you've designed your conceptual dimensional model already, um, then you know what your dimensions are, you know what your facts are. It's just a matter of choosing the appropriate attributes, appropriate non-key attributes for the uh, dimension tables and working out what the measures are for the fact table. If you've done that, well, you've got your star scanner. That's a, a, a logical uh, design, maybe even a physical design, ready to go in a relational database management system. Um, another kind of schema which you will come across, and this, this is an abomination. Um, one should not do this, but it's very common. Typically comes about because there's an, a data modeler who can't break the habit of normalising their tables. Um, this is known as a, a snowflake schema and happens because the dimension tables have been normalised. Um, the really only real advantage of doing a snowflake schema 
is that it makes the data modeler feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, the consequence is that, okay, you've got normalised dimension structures, so doing things like changing the product type becomes really easy once again. Um, Kind of, that's one approach to doing it. But you want to keep your keys simple because they become foreign keys in the fact table and that's what you use to query against. So the simpler your keys are in the fact table, the simpler the indexes will be on the fact table as well and therefore the faster the queries will run. Um, but yeah, by, if we pull out product type as a separate table, then it becomes easier to map multiple products to multiple product types. It becomes a many-to-many -many relationship which you have to resolve. but it's, you end up with this chain of normalised tables. Um, so it's, it might make your ETL process a little bit simpler, but it doesn't allow you to do anything that you can't do with this structure anyway. It makes your data modeler feel more comfortable, but it ends up creating a structure that's harder to query, because all of a sudden you've got to do a join to a join, possibly to another join to a join, and that's, every time you add an extra layer of a join, you're adding processing complexity, um, geometrical explosion uh, to the complexity of your queries. Um, and it also makes it a structure that's harder for the end users to understand. So all of a sudden, this stuff starts creeping into the user interface um, and becomes you know, hard for the, for the end users to kind of wrap their mind around. Um, this is fairly intuitive. This is yeah, not too bad, but it's, it's getting, getting more complex. So resist the urge to normalise your dimension tables. Um, there's very little benefit, really, overall. Okay, now I notice we've gone flying past the, uh, the break point. Um, how's everyone going mentally? Are you still alert and snappy? We, we don't have a lot more slides to go through, so I'm happy to push on and finish. Um, but if you want to take a break, let me know. What do you want to do? I might need a show of hands. How many people want a break? <laughs> Mads definitely wants a break. <laughs> How many people want to push on? OK, so right, I'll go slow, Mad, so you don't miss too much. <laughs> OK, so most of this dimensional modelling stuff was popularised by uh, Ralph Kimball. Um, wrote a, a book, along with a few other authors, back in 1996 um, called the uh, Data Warehousing Toolkit or Data Warehousing Lifecycle Toolkit. And he's written... A, uh, he's got a whole industry in churning out books uh, with slight variations on that title, focusing on different, uh, different aspects of, of designing uh, data warehouses. Um, the, the books tend to focus on the small-scale data mart style data warehouses rather than the enterprise scale um, large data warehouses. And his argument for that is that it provides better decision support to the end users because you can customise um, the data mart more closely to a smaller group of users' requirements than um, an enterprise warehouse is going to try and satisfy lots and lots of possibly disparate or competing or incompatible requirements from different user groups. So the smaller your user group, the more homogenous the requirements are going to be, the easier it is to satisfy the, those requirements, and the less likely it is that those requirements are going to change fundamentally such that you have to change your model significantly. So an enterprise data warehouse is a much more fragile kind of structure because you've got competing requirements and a much, more, much higher chance of those requirements changing over time. So Kimball strongly advocates small-scale data mart type approaches. And we're going to look at some different architectures um, in a couple of weeks' time, because um, there are consequences to making that decision that aren't all positive. Um, but that's certainly Kimball's approach. And this dimensional, mo dimensional modelling approach works quite well for the data mart structures, because you end up with a few small, well, sorry, a small number of base models in your data mart. Um, and because the, the there's less requirement for a high level of flexibility, there's less need for that kind of transaction level entity relationship third normal form structure um, that's kind of out there. So anyway, Kimball um, really pushed and advocated for this kind of approach. And, you know, I keep mentioning or referring to the Kimballites versus the Inmanites, and really the difference in ideology comes down to the Kimballites designing dimensional model star schema based data mart data warehouses, and the Inmanites pushing for third normal form entity relationship style enterprise scale data warehouses. That's kind of the two, two design philosophies. We're going to look at the, the Kimball stuff because it's the, probably the most different to traditional database design. Um, so Kimball's original 1996 methodology focused 
almost squarely on the data modelling process. Um, so this is kind of his first crack at a systems development life cycle for data warehousing, but kind of ignores a whole lot of stuff, um, particularly implementing the data warehouses, given one box, and really there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in there. Um, designing the ETL process, sourcing the technology, etc., etc. Anyway, this becomes a nice um, set of steps, though, for us to go through the dimensional modelling process, to guide the design process for the data structure. So he said, look, you start off by identifying the business subject that you're designing the dimensional model for. And there might be several business subjects that your warehouse has to support, but you pick one and start with that. And for your identified subject area, work out how you measure the facts. So what are the facts? Is it sales? And if it's sales, how do we measure those facts? Is it dollar sales? Is it unit sales? And so on. Obviously, that gives you the fact table, or at least the attributes in the fact table. Um, he then says, look, you move on to identifying the dimensions, but I don't think you can do, can do that without understanding what the dimensions are. So you kind of have to do both of those steps at the same time. Um, and I tend to think in terms of the dimensions first, uh, is kind of identify the subject area, think about the dimensions, and then I'll worry about the facts later. But it's a, really, these two steps go hand in hand. Well, you do them in parallel at the same time. Once you've done that, well, then you've got your structure for the star schema. Um, so you implement the data warehouse, you've got your logical design, you might make a few tweaks to it to come up with your physical design, and we'll have a look at those, what those might be in a second. Um, but you build it, source the data, cleanse the data, and assuming you've got the data there and it's of reasonable quality, you feed that into the data warehouse. And then you move on to the next subject area, and so on, until you've got the, the entire uh, data warehouse or data mart designed. Anyway, that was his 96 book. Um, and the diagram that he drew, he then went on to describe, in fact, a nine-step process. Um, so one, two, three, four, five steps in that uh, diagram. He says, no, no, there's actually nine steps, which I think is just confusing. But anyway, basically the same, same deal. But this gives us a, a bit of insight into the physical design choices we also have to make, not just the, lo the conceptual and logical. So you start out by doing the, the conceptual model, but look, identify the business process or the business subject. Um, so Kimball switches between the two terminologies. Um, and it's kind of useful to think of it in terms of not just a business subject, but a business process. So identifying a, a functional part of a, a business and saying, well, what information do they collect? What decisions get made in that process? And, and what data is available? So choose the business process. And the next step is then to think about, well, what level of detail um, do we have in the, in the fact table? So choosing the measured facts, choosing the dimensions. You notice that Kimball switches the, two, the order of those two things around himself. Um, but choosing the, the level of detail, what he, what he refers to as the granularity of the warehouse, is the first key physical design decision that you, you have to make. The design decision comes down to how big is the data warehouse going to be? And how much detail do you need in the data warehouse to provide adequate support to your decision makers? What level of detail do the users need to make better decisions? Typically, that level of detail is not individual transactions. So the, the, the finest level of granularity you could have in the data warehouse is individual transactions in the, in the data warehouse, direct from the, the, the OLTP systems. Given that most users, data warehouse users, are mid to senior level managers, maybe even top C-level executives, they're typically not so much interested in one particular transaction. Typically, they're interested in the overall trends, the overall sort of aggregate values, the summarised data. So what were sales last year? What were sales last month? How do sales from uh, January compare of 2010 compare to sales in January of 2011? Um, who are our most profitable customers? These kinds of things. It's not individual transactions they're interested in, it's the aggregate data and the patterns in that aggregate data that are important. Now, the advantage for um, data warehouse uh, developers is that that allows us to shrink the size of the data warehouse. Instead of having individual transactions, say if you've got 10,000 transactions per day, instead of 10,000 individual numbers, you've got one number for the day, if, assuming you, you choose a granularity of day. So choosing the level of detail in the data warehouse means that you can shrink significantly the size of uh, the, the amount of data that you're storing. The benefit of having a smaller data warehouse is that your queries run faster. There's less data to traverse. Um, you can also shift a lot of the calculations that end up in the reports and do those calculations in the ETL process. So you've got pre-aggregated, pre-summarised, pre-calculated 
averages, maximums, minimums, those kinds of things. So your queries become even simpler. So choosing the level of, of detail in the, fact, in the fact table, the level of granularity, determines the dimensions that you come up with, but also determines the size of the data warehouse. But you have to balance that against the level of support to the end users. So say you choose a level of granularity of, say, weeks. So you don't choose a daily granularity, you choose a weekly granularity. <laughs> and then a decision maker, one, a user wants to know, well, how do our sales patterns change by day of the week? So how, do, how does Monday differ to Tuesday, differ to Wednesday, etc.? A weekly granularity wouldn't provide that support. You wouldn't be able to do that. So you have to balance the decision maker's requirements against the performance benefits you get by having a coarser level of granularity. Getting that decision right has a major impact on how the warehouse runs over time. Um, if it's too coarse, you don't provide proper decision support. If it's too fine, then you're needlessly degrading performance. Anyway, choosing the grain of the fact table typically leads to the uh, detail within the time dimension. Um, so most granularity um, will have an effect on the time dimension. The other dimensions as well, but particularly the time dimension. Um, so you notice here that this time dimension, the level of granularity in the fact table that's supported by this time dimension is daily, daily sales. Um, but you'll also notice that it's daily sales by individual product, by individual customer, and by individual store. Now we could aggregate those as well. We could have a granularity of um, daily sales by product type, by customer type, for example, <coughs> stored in the fact table. That probably wouldn't provide very good decision support though. So even though it most obviously affects the time dimension, the other dimensions too have an impact or are impacted by the granularity decision. Okay, does that make sense? So choose the business process, choose the level of detail or the granularity, choose the dimensions, but you can't do that. You can't do step two without knowing step three. So yeah. it's, it all kind of happens in one go. Um, choose the measured facts, um, keeping in mind that they're typically numeric quantitative values, whereas the dimension values are typically qualitative, textual. But there's always examples that break the rule. Um, for example, the time dimension, that's not textual, but um, anyway. And then complete the attributes in the dimension table. So at step five, you've got your logical star schema. But there's still a few extra physical decisions to make. The next step is to handle the situation you, you um, alluded to earlier, what happens when the dimension data changes. Um, so how do we handle that change without losing the historical data that we want to keep to provide that non-volatile um, time variant uh, perspective of the data. The other physical things we have to think about also are um, creating aggregates and how we physically store those aggregate values in the data warehouse. Now we may choose not to store things like, uh, if we go back to this model here, we may choose to store in our fact table the total value for each month. Pre-calculate that in the ETL process and store that in the fact table. And the way that works is that you create a special time key for all days within a given month. <coughs> so you've got, um, if, if we take say February for example, this this year's February, it was only 28 days. So you'd expect to see 28 rows for February. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, three to 28, all with February. We might add a 29th row for February that refers to, gives us a time key for the total sales for February. So that what we end up with here in the fact table is in fact the aggregate, the summation of the previous, the, the entire month's uh, daily values. 29. Sorry? 29. Yeah, so be, well, the time key would be um, whatever the database allocates in terms of the primary key. Um, and you probably wouldn't write 29. You'd probably have an extra field here that would say, uh, or you might have text in the day field that says all of February, perhaps. Um, whereas the other ones might be first, second, third. So they'd be, they'd be ordinal values rather than the actual digit. Does everyone see how that might work? So that's one strategy for, for handling aggregate values, is to add an extra row into the fact table. Um, we're also going to see next week that you can actually create different versions of the fact tables for different aggregate levels. Um, so that's another way of doing it. We'll talk about that in detail next, next week. Um, the third way is to not do aggregates at all. Just calculate them on the fly. So when you run the report, you just do the summation. The dis disadvantage of that, of course, is that 
takes time. And if you're, it's a frequent report that gets run, you're doing the same thing over and over again. So if you can do the calculation once in the ETL process, then that's going to save time down the track. But you've got to work out how you fit it into the data structure without breaking the sort of intuitive interface. Yep. Mm. Um, if you aggregate all the data since the beginning uh, per day, for instance, mm -hmm. and maybe after three years you have to need to analyze the day, uh, daytime sales, for instance. Versus, say, evening sales, or? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, maybe I need to know at what time of the, of the day mm. I can sell more. If, it, if that's a becomes a common requirement, so a recurring thing that you need to you know, provide support in the data warehouse on a permanent basis or you know, for the rest of its life cycle, um, then you'd, you'd have to change the data structure. Um, but keep in mind that the transaction processing systems have got that data typically, if it's not live, it's probably archived somewhere. They, they generally don't ditch, throw the data away. They might overwrite the data. They may not keep it around in the same way that we keep it around in the data warehouse. But typically, that data is is still there. Um, so we might just do a customised dump of the data. Um, so a, a one-off kind of thing. Um, it might take, say, a week to do, whereas you could do it in five minutes with the data warehouse. Um, but because it's a one-off kind of thing, then it's probably OK that it takes a little while to prepare. Um, but it all depends. If it becomes a common thing, then yeah, you'd probably want to refactor your data warehouse. But it, it's a, that's not a trivial thing to do, though. It's, it's a big thing to, to do that. So this is, again, another reason why the uh, sort of Inmanite uh, proponents, the people who advocate a third normal form ER structure to the data warehouse that contains transaction-level data, they say, look, you'll never have to refactor your data warehouse again. Um, but you typically do, even even with that transaction level data. It's not just the granularity that change or the requirements of granularity that change. It's other structural stuff that changes too over time. So they have a point, but the realities are that even their designs need to change over time too. Um, OK, let's push on. So Snowflakes, uh, this is Kimball's approach. OK, so calculating aggregates and how you store that, that information, that's, there's a physical design decision there to make as well. Um, similar to the granularity decision is how long do you keep the data around for? Um, do we have the entire history of the, of the data from when the data warehouse went live to the current point in time? Or do we make a decision that, say, in two years' time, we archive off any data that's older than two years? or five years. That data warehouse that um, I mentioned earlier, that bank that no one really understood the data structure of, the, they archived the data out of that after two months. So the only data they had in that data warehouse was the most recent two months' worth of data because they couldn't fit any more in. Um, that two months' worth of data was in the order of four terabytes, I think. Um, so they literally had to archive off the historical data so that their system would keep running. Um, but you might do it just for decision requirements, uh, from a, a decision requirement perspective. And two years is perhaps too small a window, but maybe, you say, five or ten years, um, you might say, well, people aren't accessing the ten-year-old data very frequently. Um, it's more likely that most queries are going to hit more recent data, and as the data ages, it's going to get less and less use in reports. might still be used, but less frequently. Um, so that allows us to do a couple of things. One, we can archive off that data so that if someone wants to run a report on data from 10 years ago, well, they have to perhaps wait 30 minutes while that data gets loaded from an archive backup somewhere. Or we can perhaps change the level of granularity for that older data. So we can actually... And all of this is to be able to shrink the size of the, of the data warehouse. But um, it's unlikely that the level of granularity that's required to look at last week's data is the same level of granu granularity that's required to look at five years, data from five years ago. So we might want that individual transaction level for the most recent, say, 12 months, but we can get away with more aggregated data as the data gets older. Um, so you can have this shifting level of granularity based on the time. And the advantage is that it significantly shrinks the size of the, the data warehouse, keeps it small, therefore the queries run faster, and so on, and creates a better user, user experience. So all of that 
is, is going to impact the physical design of the, of the data warehouse itself. And then finally, the ETL process. So how frequently do we update the data warehouse? And that's a different decision to the granularity decision. Um, so you can have a given level of granularity, say daily, um, but you might only run the ETL process once a week, for example, um, or once a month. Depends, again, on the requirements of the decision makers. Do they need yesterday's data? Do they need today's data in the data warehouse? Or can they, can they cope with historical data? Um, what happens if you've got a frequency, say, of uh, running the ETL process once every day, but then the users start running monthly reports? So the current month, you're only going to have, say, it's the middle of the month now, you're going to have a, a significant drop in most values because we're only halfway through the current month. Um, so you need to educate your users about the nature of the data if you're uploading that, that frequently. Um, it also has an impact on how big the ETL process becomes. So the longer you wait between updates in the ETL process, the more data the ETL process has to process each time because there's been that accumulation of data over time. And you may only have a certain amount of time to run the ETL process. It's, it's known as the, um, the batch window for the ETL process. Um, so if you run it overnight, the batch window might be, say, eight hours long. Um, so close the business to when business uh, starts again the next day. And within that time, you've got to run the entire ETL process. But you don't want that ETL process to take the full eight hours because if something goes wrong, then people are going to come and you restart the ETL process, people come to work and the data's not ready. So really, if you've got an eight-hour batch window, you, you don't want your ETL process to be much longer than four hours. You probably want it about two or three hours long. So the less frequently you run, the bigger the ETL process um, becomes and the longer it takes to execute, um, and you start running up against the limitations of the batch window. Um, so there's design decisions to be made there too. Okay, so that's uh, Kimball's sort of nine-step process. Um, any questions about that? We're going to look at these sort of last um, four steps next week, so the, the physical design decisions, particularly the um, decisions about slowly changing dimensions and um, aggregate uh, storage and look at uh, how you can do that. Um, but if everyone's okay, let's do a, a quick exercise, or not exercise, a quick example, illustration of um, designing a, a data a dimensional model according to Kimball's kind of structure. And then in the tutorials, you'll, you'll actually get to do some exercises yourself. So this comes straight from Kimball's 96 book. Um, in fact, I've set chapter one of Kimball's book as reading for this week. It's, um, you can, it's available electronically through the library. I have a sneaking suspicion, though, that the library puts a limit on the number of people who can concurrently look at electronic versions. Um, so if you can't get access, don't worry too much. I'm not going to... Um, it's not going to be too much of a problem. You'll be able to access it later on. Um, but at some stage over the semester, hopefully before the first assignment, have a read of that chapter. Um, but this example is in the book as well, and you can, you can access it as well. Um, anyway, so the scenario is, um, imagine a large grocery store chain, um, perhaps with 500 stores around the country. Uh, imagine each store's got about 60,000 products on the shelves, um, and they want to be able to analyse uh, the movement of stock off the shelves um, so that they can make sure that there's enough products in the warehouses and so on um, to handle promotions and different sales patterns and things like that. Um, without having warehouses that are actually too big. Now, a couple of pieces of terminology. If you've done any retailing work, you'll know these anyway. Um, but each product, or each individual product, is referred to as a stock-keeping unit. So, uh, iPhone, this individual iPhone is a stock-keeping unit, whereas the product is iPhone in general. Um, universal product code identifies the product. So all iPhones would have the same universal product code, but they would be a different individual stock-keeping unit. Okay, so that's just setting the scenes. So identifying the business pro process or business problem is that they, they need to maximise profit. They're a commercial organisation, not too surprising. But likewise, they need to keep their shelves stocked. And the, the dilemma between the two of those is that um, one guaranteed way of having your shelves, shelves always stocked is to have really big storage space with each store, so large sort of uh, backroom warehouse type things. The problem with that is that um, the more square meterage you have for storage, the higher your um, property real estate costs are. So you want to minimise the amount of space dedicated just to storage, but you still want to have enough stock available so that you don't run out of stock um, at any given time. Now, there's a couple of different things that affect how quickly stock keeping units move off the shelves. 
And that might be um, promotions that get, get run. Um, there might be differences between stores in terms of popularity of different kinds of products. Um, there might be patterns throughout the day or week or seasonal patterns throughout the year that affect how quickly things move across. So um, the business users need to be able to understand those kinds of patterns and the impact of promotional decisions, advertising decisions and things like that um, so that they can have warehouse space that's just big enough so that they don't, run, don't run, out of, run out of stock, but not so much warehouse space that they're just simply throwing money away in terms of um, capital investment costs. So does that all kind of make sense? So that's the scenario. We're going to design a star schema to support that kind of uh, analysis. So we'll start off with Kimball's first step, choose the business process. So what's the business process that they really need to focus on? Well, it's the movement of stock from shelves. So um, it's not just capacity of the warehouses and things like that, capacities of the store, it's how quickly stock moves out um, of the store. So daily item movement is the business process. And we've already made a, a bit of a granularity decision here um, at, at the very first step. So you can see how this all kind of intertwines rather than it's a nice linear kind of decision making process. So daily item movements, um, the granularity of the fact table will be stock keeping unit by store, by promotion, by day. So can everyone see how that impacts the level of detail in the fact table? So we're not talking individual stock keeping <coughs> unit movement. It's aggregated by day, but by individual store and by promotion, if there's one in effect. Now, of course, that leads us into thinking about what our dimensions are as well. So we need product, store and promotion, um, and a time dimension as well. You're nearly always going to find a time dimension in your dimensional models because of that time variant, non-volatile kind of aspect of, of data warehouses. I've never seen a model without a time dimension. Um, and for those of you who know Peter O'Donnell, he teaches uh, 5093, he reckons he, he has seen one example of a dimensional model without a time dimension, but he thought they actually needed one. Um, so he th thought that was actually a mistake. Um, so really always have a time dimension. Okay, so already with the, the decisions about these kinds of uh, the granularity, the dimensions and so on, we've got the basic structure of our star schema already. So we can put down time, we can put down product, promotion and store. We know all of them have primary keys and we know we're going to have a, a fact table dealing with uh, item movements or sales um, and that the primary key of that table is the foreign keys from the, from the other dimension tables. We still need to decide the measures and we still need to decide the attributes for the dimension tables. Okay. So let's, step four, choose the measured facts. So how do we measure sales, um, or daily item movement? Well, the most obvious one is unit sales. That's literally stock keeping units moving off the shelves. Um, but it's probably also the case that the users are gonna wanna look at dollar sales as well. Um, it's the natural next step. Um, so thinking ahead in terms of the decision making process um, allows us to, to make some decisions here. Um, might also want to analyse that data in terms of costs too because that allows us to keep track of if we've got dollar sales and dollar costs we can make a, a basic profit calculation there as well. Um, so looking ahead to profitability. Um, probably another important thing that people, the users are going to want to know is not just items moving off the shelves but how many transactions were involved in moving those items off. It's very different if someone's walking in and buying a single can of coke versus someone who comes in and buys a, a case of 30 cans of coke. Um, so having the customer count there gives you some insight into the, the nature of the patterns that are, that are occurring with uh, sales. So we can put that in there as well. So it's not really a direct measure of sales, but it's stuff that, uh, data that is uh, characterised by the same dimensions as sales and which is useful uh, for understanding sales as well. So dollar sales, unit sales, dollar costs, customer count, all of that can go in there. Even though the strict um, reading of the business problem is that really unit sales is all that we actually need to satisfy the immediate decision problem. But always thinking ahead. Okay, so that's the, the fact table finished. We're done with that. The next step is to go around each of the dimension tables and, and populate those. So just as we kind of thought ahead a little bit with um, these measured facts to try to anticipate what the next question is going to be from the end users, we have to do the same thing with the dimension tables too. So let's start with the time dimension. Um, and a basic um, sort of structure for the time dimension would include really um, just day number and month and year 
because it's daily sales, daily transactions. Um, but we've thrown in a whole lot of other time-based information in here that allows us to look at things like, um, is it a weekend? Is it a um, holiday period? Is it a, a non-holiday period? Uh, which month is it? Which week of the year is it? And so on. So we've put in a whole lot of uh, useful attributes which could perhaps be derived from simply knowing the date of the, of the transaction, but which are pre-calculated in the ETL process to make it available for the end users there so that they don't have to do tricky SQL manipulation to derive, for example, the week number of the year or the, whether or not it's a weekday or a weekend or whether it's a holiday or not. It's all derivable, but it's there pre-calculated, made available for the end users. So they, they can do things like comparing holiday sales to non-holiday sales. Um, that's quite easy to do with this structure. Um, we can compare Mondays of different weeks to each other. Or we can compare a Monday to a Tuesday to a Wednesday, um, and so on. So it's thinking ahead, anticipating the kinds of typical questions that the end users might have, and providing support for that in the data structure. Most of those are flags, so binary sort of yes, no kind of values. Um, others are kind of pre-calculated values. Um, so that's the time dimension. Everyone's okay with that? Cool. Uh, the product dimension, again, same thing, trying to anticipate the kinds of analyses that, that might be done. So it's not just the stock keeping unit description and so on, um, but we might categorize products by their weight, um, the weight unit of measure, and given that it's concerned with sort of warehouse and storage uh, decision problems, we might include also um, how products get shipped. So the units per pack, how many packs per pallet, um, sorry, cases per pallet and so on. Um, so that we can then start making decisions about floor space required in the warehouse. Um, but we might do analysis by diet type, so the light versus the full fat version or the uh, I know, vegetarian versus non-vegetarian, those kinds of things. Um, we've also got the branding, the subcategories, so all the different hierarchies that products are categorised according to, um, so brand, line, etc, etc. So can you see what's going on here? We're trying to anticipate as much as possible the kinds of queries, the kinds of analysis, how the end users are going to try to understand the measured facts from a product perspective. So we can look at dollar sales by diet type, we can look at dollar sales by uh, department. We can look at dollar sales by individual stock keeping unit or pr individual product. Um, we can look at sales by quarter. We can look at sales by holiday versus weekend versus etc etc. So it's all built into the attributes in the dimension table. And we do the same thing for promotion and store as well. So you can see all the different kinds of um, attributes you might have about store, um, store type, age of the store, where it's located, um, those kinds of things. And with promotion, when the promotion starts, when it ends, what type of promotion? Is it a TV advertisement or a print advertisement? Is it an end of file display? Is it a coupon thing in newspapers? And so on. So all of the potential possible ways in which the end user might analyse sales by promotion or analyse sales by store and so on. Any questions on any of that? Okay, so the important thing to note with the dimension tables is that implicit in this, these attributes are a number of different, what we call, hierarchies to the dimensions. And the most obvious hierarchy, or the most obvious dimension where hierarchies play a role, is in the time dimension. We've got days, we've got weeks, we've got quarters, we've got years. So we've got different levels of aggregation, different hierarchies that time can be collapsed into. But the same thing happens with store. So we've got store type, for example. We can uh, collapse that down. Oh, we don't have store time. We've got floor plan type and things like that. We can collapse down by district and by region. So there, there are implicit hierarchies in, in the store dimension. There's a definite hierarchy in the product dimension. So brand, subcategory, category, department, and so on. Aggregate, different levels of aggregation going on there. Typically, each level of aggregation in the hierarchy involves a summation of the more detailed level below it. So weeks are a sum of the days, and so on. So they're important to keep an eye on because they allow what's known as drill down. So when the user's interacting with a report, they might start off with a very highly summarised um, overview of, a, of sales and then drill down into more levels of detail. So in the video that we saw, we saw um, the user click on a pie chart, a particular pie, and we went down into a more detailed 
um, report that showed us how the, the, that slice of pie was calculated, the numbers that made up that data. Um, what was happening was that the user was moving from one level in the hierarchy to the next level down. So that's called drilling down. We can also drill across as well, where we move from one dimension to another dimension. So changing from um, the site's product dimension in the drop-down box to the gender dimension. That's moving across, so it's, it's called drilling across. So we've got drill down, drill up, drill across, and slicing and dicing our cubes as we go. So it's all very, I don't know, uh, very chefy. Anyway, slicing and dicing, drilling up, drilling down. Um, in terms of hierarchies, Kimball talk, says that you don't need to um, have explicit hierarchies to support drilling up and drilling down. And whilst it's technically true, it really does help if you've got those explicit hierarchies built into the data structure. So the attributes in the dimensions directly support the hierarchies that you've got. Um, you can derive the hierarchies just based on the data values themselves, but if you've got it built into the actual data structure, pre-calculated by the ETL process, it becomes a much easier structure to implement for the, for the delivery system and a much easier structure for the end users to, to natively, intuitively navigate. OK, so that's hierarchies. Um, we're going to look more at those physical design decisions next week. So that means that we're at the, uh, at the end of the lecture. Um, I've, I've written week, uh, chapter one for the readings in, um, in Moodle. Um, chapter two's got the stuff specifically on dimensional modelling. Um, so chapter one lays the groundwork. Chapter two kind of covers the material that we've just covered uh, this week. Um, but really what is important for you to read is uh, Ralph Kimball's Dimensional Modelling Manifesto. It's kind of a political statement arguing for ditching the third normal form ER approach. Read that, and then next week um, there's a rebuttal to this manifesto by a guy called Robert Armstrong, who is a, a, a senior consultant with Teradata, who argues for a, a normalised kind of approach. So, before you go, <laughs> any, any questions? Sorry, guys, just stop for a second. Sorry, what was the question? What sort of holidays? This this one here, the holiday flag. No, no. What sort of holiday actually today? Oh, <laughs> uh, of course. Yes, you're not Australian, so yeah, um, it's Labor Day, so it's celebrating the union movement and the the fact that we've got a weekend and an eight-hour day, that kind of thing. Um, so we have to work, but. <laughs> There's a certain irony there, um, but, th but we get a day off between Christmas and New Year as a result. So, you know. Well, we do, staff do. You guys get it off anyway. So, um, Yeah, OK. <laughs> I'll see you guys next week. I'll see my guys in five, ten minutes or so. Thanks, Michael. Cheers.